Okay, so hi to everyone and welcome to the Man in the High Castle. And you may wonder why we're doing this program in English uh, for the first time, really. And uh, the reason for that is because we have a, a special guest, an outstanding guest, I have to say, uh, for the United States of America, the East Coast, New York State, uh, but most important for the class world. Uh, please welcome Mr. Neil Clark. Hey! Hey, cheer up, guys! Yes! Hello! Yes! Hello, Neil! Hi, Neil! Glad <clears throat> nice to meet you! Thank you nice very much for joining us, and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, the Man in the High Castle is basically a program where we uh, we're four guys, friends, that we talk about science fiction, <laughs> and... Uh, it's so, like a band, uh, no? It's a band name. Yes, that's right. And we started, I mean, uh, last year, so this is our second season. And this is actually the first time we're gonna conduct this interview in this program because we have another spin-off program for interviews. It's called uh, the Ultimate Through, but uh, this one is the our main program. So thank you very much. And uh, let me start introduce to you the other two in the main and the High Castle. We have four actually, but uh, one of them is missing. And let me start with uh, Luis Saavedra. Ah, this is me. <laughs> Hey. Reza is a science fiction writer and uh, has been engaged in science fiction for more than 20 years, basically, as an editor, you know, old story, and, uh, and also a very good friend. And uh, also we have Rodrigo Judy, uh, down there, Rodrigo, and he also is a science fiction writer. Say hello, Rodrigo, please. And uh, and also, I have to say, hello, a Ian. proud member of the Classwork community because uh, Rodrigo, I mean, published the short story, I mean, last year, not short actually, but a long one. Uh, it's called One in a Million. So yeah. uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for being with us. And uh, basically, Neil, our our audience is uh, we are talking about for people from Latin America. So as a point of start, it will be great if you can introduce yourself, uh, your relation with science fiction, class work, uh, like a little bit of a resume about you, and then we can move on to our uh, question and topics. Sure. Okay, so I'm Neil Clark. I'm best known as the publisher and editor of Clark's World magazine. I've been a Hugo nominee for Best Editor Short Form eight times, no wins. Um, and uh, I also edit several anthologies, including the Best Science Fiction of the Year series, which uh, Volume 5 should be coming out sometime soon. Good. And... Uh... And I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself, actually. I'm Pablo Castro, <laughs> political scientist. And uh, sometimes I have to listen to much electro nostril music. I also do write some science fiction short stories. So, <laughs> uh, okay, let's start, I mean, with the uh, class word, basically. Uh, it's my understanding that you started in 2006. Uh, so if I do my calculation next year in 2021, it's going to be the 15 years, I mean, uh, of your magazine. So uh, uh, what about in some way you can tell us the story about Class Worlds? I mean, the, um, you can tell us about the more important achievement, uh, your general view about all this process. I mean, Class World is very successful and a lot of writers have been a, a Yuga Nebula Award. So how can you tell about this 15 years long trip of your magazine? Uh, well, it, it's a trip I never expected to be taking. Uh, the magazine sort of came out of a conversation at a science fiction convention uh, on a Friday night. And by Sunday night, we were fully staffed. And three months later, we had our first issue out. So it, it was just one of those impulse things. Um, and, you know, in 2006, online magazines weren't really doing that well. Uh, most of them were closing down as quickly as they were opening. Uh, so we were kind of lucky to, to make it out of that. And some of that came from just taking a look at the field and seeing where others had maybe had some missteps or successes and tried to, to go from there. Um, I would say at the very beginning, uh, when, we, when we were first uh, getting off the ground, we had a lot of authors telling us, oh no, I won't print, I won't publish online. That's, that's for new authors and, and pirates will steal my work. Uh, and you know, about three years in, the attitude towards online fiction changed tremendously. So I think we, we uh, benefited from right place, right time uh, in that regard. Uh, but we had to survive a while to get 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 to that point. Um, 
we've always been interested in in um, you know doing something a little bit different. You know, so we I, I get bored very easily. Uh, so so I, I I I tell people if they are asking me, well, what kind of story are you looking for? And I I can't answer that one. It's it's a moving target, uh, influenced by every story I've read before. And I've been reading stories since I was 10 years old. So you know, somewhere around 75, 76 is when I first started reading science fiction. Um, and I'm not looking for stories I would have read when I was a teenager. I, you know, I'm, I, we've, science fiction is always moving forward and that's a very important part to me. And I think that's one of the things that's uh, drawn me towards um, having uh, uh, more international voices within the magazine itself, um, because uh, the, uh, you probably, uh, a number of your audience probably aren't familiar with how, how narrow the U.S. Uh, publishing scene is. We, we do not see a lot of works in translations or works from outside uh, the U.S. And it's changing, it's getting better. But uh, when we first started, it, it it was pretty much a wasteland in, in 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 that regard. There's a few isolated places here and there, um, and that's one of the things we're we're kind of proud of having um, been riding at the front of that wave and and widening uh, the community uh, for uh, uh, the international science fiction within the U.S. Um, so so I, I guess that that's part of the uh, the formula to how we got to where we are. I'm sorry. When, when you say well, when when you started, I mean, when you say we. It was just you, or you and, and other people that made collective effort. Or well, the, the magazine's never done in isolation. So, so Sean Wallace is the only person who's been with me since the beginning, okay. uh, and and we work pretty closely uh, and have for a number of years. And he's like my little brother at this point. And then there's Kate Baker who does our nonfiction and our podcast. Um, so she she narrates all the stories and she's like my little sister. So so we're 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 kind of a, a group here. And then we have a number of other people who've who've worked with us over the years who've who've done a, you know different roles within the publication. Some slush readers, um, uh, a couple of different nonfiction editors, um, uh, interviewers, things like that. Okay, okay I, Luis, yes, you I, want to draft to something. Yes, I want to jump in because in, on a point, you said uh, I like a different story from my youth. Uh, what uh, What did you like since then? What I like when I was 10? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I was... Okay, so I started with... Um, uh, actually... <laughs> Adventures in Time and Space. Oh, this nice. is this is the <laughs> anthology that started me, and this is a a golden age anthology. Uh, it, it's it's pretty much the the big one of the, of the time, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it was edited by Helian McComas, and it includes yes. stories by a wide range of of the all the classic science fiction writers. And that's that was my launching point. And you know, then so by the time I got to college, and I was a, a computer science major, cyberpunk hit. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so then you can see where where my my interest, considering my 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 uh, career path at the time, and uh, and where the fiction was going, it, it, it so my that so it drifted that way. Um, I would and and one of the big authors who influenced me. Uh, is probably very near and dear to you guys since since you've, your <laughs> podcast is named after his work. Yeah. Philip K. Dick yeah. uh, was somebody who I think um, was really ahead of his time and doing very interesting work. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm reading a lot of it after, well after it's been published. Um, uh, but uh, I would say, you know, people like that were what was shaping what I was what I was reading back then. You were talking about the um, um, about glassware and basically also about the um, we call the internalization of science fiction, uh, which is actually sounds like a trend right now. And uh, it was in glassware is be actually very interesting. I mean, uh, pioneer in some way. So um, Rodrigo, you wanted to ask us something regarding this very important topic. Yeah, um, yeah, I, 
of course, uh, Clark's work has been involved in the theme of in the topic of internationalization. What is your assessment of the ge general situation on internationalization right now? Um, what, what are your thoughts about this? How it's, it's, it's developing in a general view? I mean, in a general view, um, mm -hmm. well, I think that that. Uh, I, I'm on record as calling U.S.-based science fiction or English language science fiction uh, an invasive species. Much more of our work is being translated and exported to other countries than is being imported or even written locally in some cases. Um, I, I talk to a lot of authors and editors and publishers from all over the world and I've had people telling me, you know, there's more work translated from English than local authors published here. Uh, and that, that I think is a problem. Um, now, maybe it, maybe if they didn't have a, a tradition of science fiction, that's an, uh, a necessary step to, to, to get things started, but that shouldn't be the case for an extended period of time. I would really love to see um, healthier local science fiction communities um, uh, coming up and, and more of those works going to the international stage. I think right now we still have a problem that um, uh, the American market or in particular, uh, Uh, English language market is sort of a pedestal where you know a lot of people from outside those markets really want to get in there because that's where they believe they'll be seen that's where the the Hugo Awards will cover that and it, there's a lot of prestige that goes along with that um, and it's it's not a bad thing but it's an indication uh, that there that there's the, the situation isn't quite healthy um, you know I'm not going to discourage anybody from trying to get published in English. I think it it it, it helps um, on our side uh, to see more uh, varied perspectives, uh, particularly with such a long history in science fiction. Here, you know, having other perspectives brought, broadens the genre and makes it stronger. Um, and uh, um, I, I'm I'm. I'm cautiously optimistic, I guess, is what I, I, I would how I would describe right now what's happening in the in the U.S. with regards to seeing more um, uh, international and translated works being published. But there's still a long way to go. Okay. Um, you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of progress that's been done in the last decade. There's a few editors that have done some really good work, like the Vandermeers and you know a few others that that I think have been championing. Um, voices that might not have normally had an opportunity just due to the complexities of of, of, of of publishing. I think one of the major changes that's actually benefited this is just the fact that the internet exists. You know, <laughs> that, you know, science fiction met reality with, with the internet. And now it's, you know, um, when I first started, it was very common for a lot of the major publications to still be taking paper submissions as their primary form. And there's a cost barrier to that. Yeah. So, and given the acceptance rates at most magazines, you could send out a story uh, multiple times and, and, and not uh, make the amount of, uh, you would spend more than you would make from publishing the story uh, if you were sending internationally. So that was something of a deterrent. Uh, so the, the, I think you've got a number of different factors coming together right now. Um, and that, that means that we have an opportunity. Uh, and I, I think that it's important that we seize upon it. Okay. Uh, there has been a, a Chinese edition in the works for about two or three years. Um, but that's, that's the only one that we've had any, uh, interest, um, from outside in. So if anybody wants to talk to us about doing uh, a different language edition of the magazine, we'd be happy to chat with them. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Rudy, please. Yeah. What can you tell us about the involvement of Clark's work in the actual boom of the Chinese science fiction? How, I, I know that Clark's work has been involved, but maybe mo most people don't know exactly the, 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 how much you have helped in, the, in this process. Well, um, So, so a lot of the, the, the novels got their, their boost th with, with uh, special thanks to Ken Liu. And, and uh, Ken was also sending us short stories um, that he had translated. Actually, the first story he translated 
uh, and sold, but uh, uh, he sold it to us. And uh, we loved it so much, we, we asked him to keep sending us any of the translations he worked on. So over, uh, over a couple of years, we had a few from him and John Chu and, um, and that got attention in China. So, uh, and we didn't know about it. <laughs> we, we, I mean, we're, we're kind of living here in our little bubble um, and we had no idea how much attention that was getting back in China. And one day I, I got an email from uh, the head of a company I had never heard of. And he said, um, we'd like to help you make sure that this happens more regularly. And I wasn't sure what to make of it. Uh, it turned out that, uh, so I, I reached out to Ken, asked if he, he knew anybody who knew anything about them. It turned out to be Storycom, who we've now been working with uh, for over five years. And uh, they are helping us fund uh, the translations of all the Chinese science fiction you're seeing in Clark's world. Uh, trans translations, one of the biggest obstacles is the extra money it costs to get it translated. Um, and quite often, uh, sadly, uh, the traditional uh, approach for, for a publisher here to, to pay for, particularly in short fiction, is to say, oh, we pay six cents a word, you can split it between the translator and the author. And I don't like that. Um, that's not how it's supposed to work. Um, it's a deterrent uh, because they're getting paid less. Um, and uh, with Storycom, we're actually commissioning the translations, uh, and we're paying the translators a going rate, you know, for for their for their work. Uh, and as a result, we've also incorporated into what we do now. Um, we've set aside money to that when we do a translation, that it, you know, if um, uh, like we just published a, a translation from Japan in the current issue. Um, the translator and the author both get the same pay rate, but it's our full pay rate, not a split pay rate. And I think that that's the sort of thing that needs to, to keep happening to, to keep this sort of thing moving. Because translators can make a lot more money um, uh, doing other things than fiction uh, in sci or science fiction because it doesn't pay that well. I mean, the short fiction rate's not not many people are making a living off of short fiction. You know, I, I have a, I mean, we're talking about um, China and Chinese science fiction that have uh, got a lot of attention and uh, some years ago, and, and of course, class were I mean, very, very involved in this process. Uh, I saw a lot of interviews, I mean, uh, at you, I mean, asking for that. And, uh, but uh, my question is maybe from geopolitics, because right now situation, especially between uh, US and China, um, it's not really good. Some of the people, are, I mean, analysts, international analysts are talking about uh, possibly becoming Cold War or something. So in this case, I, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, do you think it's gonna, this situation will affect, I mean, the, uh, uh, I don't know, the um, Chinese writer, I mean, publishing in the marketplace in, in the United States. and. If this topic about the uh, this is struggling between China, United States, or or even the whole situation in China and Asia Pacific region, you know that the other day there were some clashes in the border with India, the Taiwan situation. It's also could be a topic as a, or can be a, in some way writers from China talking about this, or they included in their last I mean uh, fiction. Yeah, the the way I, I look at it is Trump doesn't represent my attitudes towards things, so I'm not going to hold anybody else's president as as uh, 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 an example of what their their beliefs are, what their writing is going to be like. We're we're all science fiction fans, uh, and science fiction is at its heart somewhat subversive. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it, which is why I've always been kind of amused that you know you, you'll see. Uh, such an emphasis on science fiction in places where where subversion you might not think it it would be that well accepted. Um, so you know the, the my bigger concern actually was was with with the authors and making sure they didn't get in trouble for anything that they might have sold me. Um, and it was funny because the response I got was, "We know where the lines are. Uh, don't worry about us. We'll be okay." Um, and I, I sort of took that to heart, and it it actually made it easier to 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 uh, for me to wrap my mind around how to edit uh, translations and things like that. Was um, you know, 
it, it editing is a trust process anyway. So here I was questioning <laughs> whether or not I should trust them to stay safe. And of course they're going to, 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 <laughs> to uh, do the right thing by, by themselves. So I'm not particularly worried. You know, I, I've gotten uh, I've gotten some emails from from a few fringe people that are like, "You're supporting a foreign." No, I'm supporting <laughs> foreign writers. Uh, you know, I'm not sending money to the government there. I am sending money to a college student or or a, you know, in some cases, college professor. Whatever. It's it's um, uh, and I've gotten to know a lot a lot of the authors now over over the last few years. I've been to China. Um, uh, to to one of their uh, to two of their their conventions and I got to meet a number of them and uh, a number of the our, our authors have been here um, so you know they're fans like like anybody else so I'm not at all worried about that um, there are going to be geopolitical issues with almost every country somebody doesn't like somebody no matter what I don't know if there's any country that's completely immune to criticism. Um, and like I said, there, you know, right now we're not doing so hot here. So, so, uh, I, I feel like, uh, I'm living in a, in a glass house and shouldn't be throwing stones. Well, exactly. I mean, it, the, so interesting about the, uh, I think, uh, it was, uh, Obama that, uh, he mentioned, I mean, the, the tree body problems mm-hmm. was him when the, uh, I mean, uh, he highlighted, I mean, that, that novel. So, uh, in some way, I mean, the, uh, the American government, I mean, actually was promoted. I mean, uh, Chinese science fiction has not been so far. Well, and uh, okay, let's move on to uh, editorial policies. And and here, uh, I will start. I mean, actually, the question regarding, I mean, you or and, and, and your team. I mean, how you deal with some are um, sensitive or maybe complicated in mean, Asian topic regarding fiction. At the moment, you have to decide as I mean to publish something. I think I remember that uh, there wasn't a story that uh, exactly it was Nebula World Winner uh, that was published in a magazine. I was thinking it was Spar, I think mm-hmm. was the name of it. Yeah, okay, Spar. <laughs> I'm yes. not quite sure, but I think it, it was you, I think you were talking about the uh, before to publish this story, you were talking with different guys or people. I mean, do you, what do you think about the story? It could be working out pretty well or not. I mean, so uh, I, we'll, we'll have interest you know, I mean, how this process, I mean, uh, raised for you over your magazine. Well, stories like Spar are sort of a, 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 a rarity. The, you know, it's 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 an amazingly written story, but it's intense, and it was it was intense at a level like every year post Spar. You know, people have read that, and now it's you know, the the bar moved a little bit with that story. Um, but when we first saw it, we're like, this is amazing. Will people kill us if we publish it? And we got we got hate mail. Uh, we we got you know you're destroying science fiction by publishing tr- trash like this. And you know the story was up for various awards. It it uh, um, it was brilliant. Um, and it's one of those stories that's really hard to remove from your head once you've read it because it's 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 so uh, vivid and intense. Um, in fact, it kind of kind of amuses me that Kidge later wrote a, a uh, version of the story called the Bacon Remix, which we reprinted. And we, we call it the antidote in house um, because after you've read that one, the other ones, <laughs> it's it's sort of it, it, it allows your brain to 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 um, recover. But I think when you're when you when you're uh, approaching controversial issues, you really need to to be careful getting a second opinion or a third opinion um, just to make sure that be, that you're not stepping into something that you're not that well informed about. So, sorry, you know, before to me, I mean, the question you, you, you mentioned this version, the remix version of the yes. part. I mean, is it possible to do something like that and you're, you're publishing a story then you say, hmm, was not so good? Or maybe I want to maybe uh, just publish an alternative version, put a remix as the electronic music or something like that? <laughs> well, the, the remix was done as as a, a joke story, uh, I believe, for, for a charity anthology. Yeah. Um, and it didn't get much um, uh, distribution. Uh, I tried to get a copy of the anthology and I was never able to get one. So so when I, when I heard about it um, and, and saw the story, eventually I, I was like, no, we... We really need to share this. We need to have this be out there a bit more because it's more, it's where Spar doesn't really have much in the way of humor. The Bacon remix is humor. 
Um, and I think it, it, it's it's a uh, and and you look at the two stories and you go, okay, this is this this is this way, and then this is this way with just subtle changes. How much that changes the story? Um, and I, I I thought it was just something that that we needed to share. That, that um, could be really fun. I mean, like your replicate. I mean, like you're having in music where you have a single. Remember that, and then you have like a six or seven, like a, the best mob or somebody in the eighties. This so, so are. Okay. But I mean, one story, then you have a different versions. <laughs> yeah. Or that well, is really fun. Uh, Rodrigo, you have a question about that? Yeah, yes. in the same in the same line. Um, what what do you think? What about diversity? What uh, class of class work would taught us? taught us in that about diversity how how has been the deal the way the, that classes have been with this top with this topic in particular diversity and inclusion um well i think a part of my my approach is to is to include different voices i mean it, it you have to, to to make it part of what you're doing um which is you know so so Stepping back to the translations, for example, I had a lot of people ask me, why don't you just do a theme issue and do a China month or whatever? And yeah, we could have done all the stories in one month. And yeah, the stories would have still been read. But it it, it says to me, the only way these stories could get published if they're in a theme issue. And that's not true. They're just as good as all the other stories. What makes them different? Where they were written. That's it. Um, you know, so, so, you know, my goal in all of this is to make translation normal to like, like to not th have a second thought when you encounter a translated story, it's just another story. Um, and you know, cause that's how I'm seeing it. And, but that's not how our community is seeing it. Um, uh, so much so that, that you know, we have, you know, some people trying to uh, carve out special award space for translations. Yeah, um, about yeah, so the so for me, it was a matter of making it who we are and doing it every month when possible. And when we skip a month, we usually skip a month because the translation needed more time and I'm not going to rush it. Now, story is not ready. It's not ready. It moves to the next issue. Um, so I'm not treating it as as special in that regard either. I'm just making sure that we made room uh, in our in our lineup for it. We actually added the story slot uh, rather than uh, because I knew the criticism I would get would be, oh, you're taking a story away from Americans to to give a special opportunity to people from outside. No. No, we created, we, we opened up a whole new thing. We didn't want to have the, the fight over something that silly. Um, this was important to me. It was important to, to, to our team and we wanted to do it right. And we felt that doing it right was making it incor incorporating in at, the, at the, the DNA of the publication. Mm -hmm. Luis. Thanks, Pablo. Okay, uh, you're famous uh, for one inter you don't like certain fantastic topics like uh, zombies or werewolves. Have you found a similar bias in science fiction field? Um, I think every editor has has their pet peeves of things they they don't particularly like. Um, you know, zombies is my pretty pretty well known pet peeve, um, particularly when they try and portray it as science fiction because it just doesn't work. It's it's bad science fiction. Um, But yeah, so I, I keep wondering why all of these uh, like like this is the way direction my head goes when when I hear about a zombie story and it's happening two years past the zombie apocalypse. How come all the crows and other birds of prey haven't had like how come they're not all fat? You know, <laughs> and why are there still zombies running around? Decay should have they should be skeletons on the ground. Um, yeah, how are they moving? You know, it's very so I, I can't suspend my disbelief with the entire subject because my brain keeps going off on these tangents of how why didn't this happen? And I think that's an important part of science fiction is understanding the consequences of the science you've used. Um, so if you create a story with teleportation you better take into consideration all the consequences of teleportation um, because it changes the rules of so many different things. Um, 
uh, and time travel. And you know, so these are why all these topics become a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, so in science fiction, I don't know that there's a specific theme that I, 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 I don't, uh, uh, that, that I would discourage people from. I think it's just the types of writing or the types of themes. Now, obviously, zombies tend to fall more towards horror. So do werewolves. I think some of that might be that I've fallen out of horror as well. Um, uh, I think uh, we stopped accepting horror submissions a few years ago because I realized that I I wasn't enjoying horror anymore. Uh, and part of that was that I had had a brush with death and I had enough darkness. I saw I got pretty close up to the line there and I, I, I just need a break. So who knows, someday we might start doing that stuff again. Thanks. Um, I had a question, actually, uh, it could be a question for everyone, actually, not just for you, but also for Luis and, and Rodrigo. It's, okay. um, I think th this year, I think it was this year, uh, there was a story that was published in class where that uh, was called uh, A Sexual Army Identifies Attack Helicopter. Is where the, uh, the the title and uh, it caused a lot of the uh, um, some people. I mean, there uh, it was a very I have to say very interesting story, but uh, uh, some people maybe I uh, got offended. It was a little bit controversial. And uh, my question is probably regarding I mean the uh, if you're looking at the story of science fiction, you know, are you are gonna find I mean our authors like uh, I don't know Norman Spearhead or the. Uh, uh, books like the dangerous uh, visions that uh, in some way all they also were very controversial at least we're talking about he received a lot of email I mean there is something I mean they complained about the, the whole story and uh, but in some way it, it was a part of the uh, I think that how science fiction also was in some way getting through you know and are breaking sometimes the rule or something uh, do you think that it's also part today of the characteristic of science fiction or do you feel that writers right now are more in some way conscious to say okay that could be tricky that could be complicated so maybe it's not good to move it that way i don't want to judge i mean i mean i mean writers or in the case of uh, this particular writer i don't remember the name of uh, the story that was published in classwork but uh it's just i mean a question about the I mean if you compare them with other um uh, in the story of science fiction decades before and the current situation today no, so so uh, this situation is kind of a painful chapter um, because the author in this situation was treated very unfairly. Uh, there were a lot of assumptions made. Uh, there, uh, and and uh, it was a very painful experience for them. Uh, and. Uh, um, I, I made a statement on our website that pretty much covers everything that, that I had to say on it. Um, but I do stand firmly behind Isabel. Um, I, I, uh, um, uh, it, it, it was, um, a situation where, where I had been recovering from surgery in the hospital while all this unfolded too. Um, so it, 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 Coming out of that and and seeing all of this happen to to somebody that that uh, didn't deserve uh, what they what they got um, uh, was was um, and still is a very disappointing chapter in in uh, short fiction in recent years. I think um, there were people who were criticizing the story that hadn't read it um, that were were uh, that they actually caused the author to out themselves. Um, which is a terrible thing to have happen. Now that that's not that forcing that decision on somebody is terrible. Uh, so I will say though that you mentioned some some past things like dangerous visions. I don't think dangerous visions would be dangerous today. Uh, I think the line keeps moving, um, and uh, hopefully our community learns a little something from January's episode. Okay. So we have the, uh, Rodrigo, you want to add something? Well, answering your question, uh, I, uh, you as a writer, you need to be aware of the, of the world where you live in. And if you choose to address uh, difficult topics, 
it's okay, it's your freedom. And, and I, I have done that in, in, a, in, in some occasions. But you know that you are going to be uh, in a difficult line and you must be prepared for that, whatever it happens. If the, if the crowd applauds you or if the crowds uh, don't do that, you, you, you know that you are taking a risk. Uh, I'm not, I'm speaking about my experience. I know what happened with the story that you know, and there are other other things there that are very sad, as you said, and um, and I'm not going to say nothing more about that. I am explaining from things that I have done, yeah, not others. Well, thank you. And just to move on to the next topic, which is quite interesting, is basically who's Neil Clark? Oh, big topic. <laughs> So um, I can't well, wait for the topic, answer. Yeah, we'll find out <laughs> I mean, who's Neil Clark, basically. And it's well, it's basically Neil about are you are you know, for example your devotion like the, the music mm -hmm. are are also mean there who is actually what you can tell to us about you are and the only besides actually science fiction that we want to yeah. question to, to Luis. Um. Well. Um. Let's see. I, I'm well. I'm a dad. Uh, I've got two sons who are, you know, one, my youngest is a senior in high school, and my my oldest is out working. Uh, but I I think I came to science fiction as as a kid. I never thought I'd see a career in this. Um, I, I when I went to college, I mentioned I was a computer science major. Um, I took one English class. Uh, my university did not have any interest in science fiction, so I didn't have any interest in the English department. Um, and uh, so it's kind of weird that I would end up uh, in this profession. Like I said, it was not something I had ever planned on. Uh, it just sort of happened. Um, and uh, it's a happy coincidence because you know, I, I ended up working in academia for over 25 years. I was um, a lot of the work I did was instructional design, which right now with the pandemic and all these online courses, that's really a, a profession that's very badly needed. Like we need teachers to be trained in how to do this and they're not getting it. Um, so I could do an entire talk on that. <laughs> but uh, the the uh, uh, that career uh, was one I loved and never saw myself leaving. Uh, then I found this and, you know, had a heart attack that sort of said, hey, you know, you don't love that old job anymore. And this is this is the new one you should be taking. And uh, and the heart attack left me a cyborg. So <laughs> that caused my first anthology, the, the cyborg anthology edited by a cyborg. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see what else. What else? Um, I don't know. I, I, um, I can, I only speak English, um, which is why we're doing this one in English. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, the reason uh, why we're doing this program in English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, like many of my fellow countrymen, I can only speak one language, which is, which is a great disappointment to me, but it's the one thing that I have a lot of difficulty learning uh is is other languages um and my old career had me working with professors in different disciplines on a daily basis so i sort of found out this was the one subject that i couldn't couldn't uh wrap my mind around um which is funny because you know i i'm obviously editing english and i should be able to to learn other languages but who knows something about my brain just doesn't it doesn't hold uh yeah, I'm I, I'm sort of sort of struggling here trying to figure out, like <laughs> summarize my life history. It's <laughs> I was a bookseller for a while. Um, uh, about, that's where uh, the well, magazine actually started. Was part of the bookstore. Hmm. What about the music? Because that interview to Jean Michel Jarre was quite interesting. I have to say, was yeah, quite, quite impressed. Oh uh, yeah, I've been sort of a. a, a I don't play any instruments, but I, I I listen to a lot of music. Like I I very rarely work in silence. There's almost always music going. Um, so the 
I started going to concerts again and then the pandemic hit. You know, I, I, when the kids were born, I, I stopped going for a while. And um, and la uh, last year, or was it last year? I can't even remember what year it is anymore. Um, uh, the last two concerts I went to were um, uh, Peter Murphy, who was a Bauhaus, oh. and um, Midger, who was a Vultravox. Uh, so, you know, those were people I listened to in college and, and they're still touring. And I was like, I'll never see them in a small venue like this ever again <laughs> because they played small clubs. So I ended up like first or third row seats in, in most cases. Um, uh, but uh, music's been always uh, very important. Uh, I tend to, to uh, listen to a, a lot of stuff that might trend a little bit more electronic. Um, uh, but it, it tends it tends to cover a wide range. I, I'm not so much someone who's into to, to pop, um, uh, but you know sometimes it can cross over. Well, don't forget April, New York is front of forty two. I mean, touring America. Well, if if we can go, <laughs> <laughs> remember I, I uh, yeah I'm a high risk person uh, you know, during all of this because of the the, the heart damage. Um, but I would love to go see them. Uh, they're, they're one of those groups that every time they would come around, uh, I'd be somewhere else. Like, like, oh, you're going to be in California the weekend they're in New York. And, and New York would have been a, a, you know, a train ride for me. And, uh, and it, it happened a lot with several bands that I, I like. So, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to get to see Front 242 at some point. Um, most, the, of, most of the band they were postponed. I mean, in tour or something because of the uh, COVID nineteen. Actually, I see. Yeah, yeah, and and some of them are just outright canceling. So you know, I, I've I've just stopped paying attention to the websites to see who's coming around because I don't know when we're going to be able to go back out again. Um, all the venues here would still be closed anyway. Um, they haven't reopened a lot of those yet. And uh, uh, you mentioned Jar. He uh, actually, they approached us about doing the interview. Um, oh, really? They, yeah, they said he's a science fiction fan, and that you know he's influenced a lot of people, and blah blah blah. And, and I think they weren't expecting me to say yes, <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful experience to get and sit and chat with him for for you know an, an hour, an hour and a half. Um, he's a very interesting guy and a very talented musician. Uh, did you have a chance to, to see the concert? Or he was not doing it. He was not on tour. He was just in the city for something. Okay. I, I, I don't know what, I, I think it was business related, but it wasn't, the, the new album had been out. I think he was doing interviews for for, for different okay. uh, no magazines sure. and stuff like that at the time, but mostly music magazines. So he was kind of surprised, I think pleasantly to, to come across a science fiction magazine that wanted to talk to him. Um, but uh, I, I think that you know, I'd love to do more stuff like that because there's a lot of tie over from music to science fiction. Uh, and and I think we, we need to embrace a little bit more of that. Yeah, that's a good, very good point, actually. And um, OK, just move on to Latin America. <laughs> Have you ever been in Latin America? Uh, no, unfortunately not. OK, so. Um, well, I have. I mean, Rodrigo has a question about uh, Latin America, and but uh, you got. I mean, uh, a lot of our uh, submissions coming from Latin America. I think. From, well, we we just accepted a few from Brazil, um, and and obviously we we have Rodrigo here. Uh, <laughs> I'm a very uh, good example. Yeah. So uh, Rodrigo, go ahead. I would love to see more. Uh, just putting that out there. Yeah, but you, Don't you, worry, you, after this interview, you're going to receive tons of <laughs> story. story. I mean, yes, yes, tons and tons. <laughs> but, but, let's say but recently you have published people from Cuba, Mexico, I think. I have seen some 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 Latin American writers in your pages. Yeah. Uh, relatively frequently. Some. So, how it's been, well, in general view, uh, in, in, in this 14 years. How, how has been your dialogue with the science fiction, Latino, uh, Latin American science fiction, um, and what is what do you think is going to be from now on? Uh, well, I, I would say that that it's a, it's been a slow moving process. Uh, I think it's been more in the last few years that we've started to to engage more with Latin America. 
uh, that we're, we're, we're seeing readership and submissions going up from, from that region, which is a good thing. Um, and it's, it's now uh, having conversations like this and uh, you know, some events earlier this year, uh, we're building more connections in those regions. So there's a, a couple of editors I'm in touch with now um, and, and, and a few authors and, and you know, that these things build over time. So I, I look at the, this as, as, as uh, something that's moving in the right direction. We're actually, uh, I, I have been talking with somebody about the possibility of, um, so one of the big issues is that all our submissions need to be in English. And that's a problem. Um, but what we've been doing with China and the South Korean translations we did last year um, sort of built a model that we might be able to do some other projects. Uh, we don't like those other ones were funded by third parties, but we've been trying to figure out what we could do in house. Uh, and I've been talking with somebody about the possibility of doing a submission window where we have a number of, of, of first readers who uh, can read Spanish uh, and allow uh, a, a short window of, uh, of, of Spanish language submissions from which we would commission the translations. So that's, that's something that we're looking at um, as, a, as an opportunity. Um, with the pandemic and everything, it's it's been a little bit more chaotic trying to figure out how to do that. But it is something that I would I would love to see us be able to do in 21, um, just because it would further what we the work we've been doing uh, and create some opportunities for those people who don't have access to someone who can translate for them or they can't translate themselves. We have the uh, the quiz game. Oh yes, because this section yeah. is, uh, is yeah. Is the famous question for Luis. It's basically, I mean, Luis is going to read some uh, sentences, phrases you have to complete. Yes, them. yes, because uh, this section is uh, similar to the quiz game. Uh, we have chosen uh, five sentences, the first part of the phrase, and you can find uh, a proper ending for that. And after each one, uh, we can talk about your decision a little. So, are you prepared? I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rabbit. There we go. The first one is a game changing moment in Glasswell magazine history was. Game changing moment. Um, our first Hugo nomination. Oh, it's a nice, nice one. Your or, or a story? For the, um, we were actually nominated for semi prosing before any of our stories were nominated. Okay. <laughs> and the second one is uh, you have expressed a preference for your story. Uh, your, fourth, your form of fiction is suitable for you because. Um, because that's where all the interesting stuff in science fiction starts. It's it's where all the experimentation and new ideas first come in, the new authors. Um, it's it's where the excitement is. Okay. The uh, third one is, what are the best advices as an editor you can give to a new writer would be? Uh, read widely. Um, not just in in the genre you're writing in, because you can you can steal techniques and tricks and things like that from any any genre. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, you know, most like a lot of editors have their email address on their website, like I do. And if you have any questions, just email me. And you know, it's not really a burden. I put my email address out there for a reason. Oh, okay. Uh <laughs> The first one is Nick Clark discontinued Forever Magazine, a uh, science fiction magazine for reprints in 2018 because? Uh, because he didn't know he was going to end up editing a year's best anthology. <laughs> 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 I had launched the magazine and then got offered the series. And uh, you know, I was thinking that um, Forever gave me a chance to feature uh, reprints of stories that I really liked, but didn't get a chance to put out there. And that's what the year's best is doing for me. So Forever had to change course a little bit when when that when that came into being. But um, it's still 
um, allows me to stretch my wings and and feature things that I might not have wanted to include in Clark's world. Okay, thanks. Uh, I made that question because, uh, in my opinion, the soul the soul structure of the American market uh, doesn't allow much much reprinting. You know, not only from uh, for a short story novel from just a year. Uh, but also uh, golden, silver age uh, names. Uh, uh, it came to my mind uh, these, two, these two, ne- two names, uh, Fritz Leiber and Judith Mirror. Uh, they were uh, big names in the 1950s and 1960s in science fiction magazines and anthologies, always uh, shortlisted in, in the Hugh and Nebula ballots. But for me, uh, uh, they are lost, almost forgotten uh, to, new, to new generations. So, uh, do you think it's a it's a good idea to bring back all these uh, these uh, big names or, or forgotten? Not not uh, not from the uh, from the first line. It's most of the, uh, from the second and third line. Uh, uh, more su- more suitable for or making attractive, appealing to the new generations. Yeah, that, I mean, there's a lot of conversation actually going on about canon, the 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 SF canon uh, right now, and because uh, there's a there's a portion of the the science fiction community that doesn't believe you're you're really a science fiction fan unless you've read you know, Asimov's and 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 it's you know Clark and Heinlein and and you know various people uh, that that were big names before a lot of the current readers were born. Um, and I'm more in the camp of science fiction stands on the shoulders of those who came before. Um, and that, uh, you know, there's a net welcome entry point at, at any level uh, where, you, where you want. If you wanted to start just reading current science fiction, you're still a science fiction fan. Um, do I worry that they're missing something by not reading the classics? Not so much because some of those... Um, regrettably, don't hold up so well. Um, uh, th- there are there are a number of, of stories that that I have um, that have caused me never to reread because I, I remember them very strongly from my from you know maybe my teenage years and I loved them and then I went back and re- reread them as an adult and thought oh wow that's not a good idea. <laughs> um, so that you know there's there's obviously some that stand the test of time and yeah I love to see that those those get reprinted so that there there's an opportunity for people to see them again but it's it doesn't tend to be where I focus my energy. Um, so with with forever I tend to and my and my anthologies my theme anthology I tend to stick to a 20 year window um, uh, for those um, with the exception of the uh, uh, moon landing anthology I did because that was a retrospective from the moon landing to to present day and had to cover 50 years of, of time. So um, it was tough finding older stories that would actually um, play well with with modern stories and, and read like a cohesive book. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, mm-hmm. The last one is a, is, is a good one, it's tricky. Uh, those like this, uh, if Nick Clark wrote a science fiction show story, this would be about him writing a science fiction story because that's science fiction. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I don't write, so so I can't even. So it, it's definitely an alternate future <coughs> if I'm writing. Um, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, the, I, I know my limits, and that's one of them. Yeah, but choose, choose, I know, well, recently, CC Finlay sent a story to Analog. Oh, yeah. So, Charlie Charlie was writing short fiction before he became an yeah. editor. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, there's a number, I'm there's, sorry. there's, you know, a few editors that don't write at all. And there's, there's some that, that do. So you have people like uh, Gardner Dozois was a writer. Um, Sheila Williams is not. Um, uh, Char- Charlie Finley is. Uh, John Joseph Adams is not. So I'm in the not group. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you never has started something like that. His name was John. Never? Oh, God, no. no I, the problem is I can't turn my internal editor off and I will okay. sand any story down into oblivion because I, I will never get past the first paragraph. I'll rewrite, rewrite, change, <laughs> rewrite, get the second paragraph, delete the first part. <laughs> and just, it just doesn't work. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so we are moving to the end. I don't know, guys, if you have a final question or something. Okay. You go, please. Yes. You're okay. And you. So, uh, so Neil, thank you very, very much um, for your time. And we hope that we can actually meet again at uh, this country. I don't know if this country is happening or not. It's uh, August next year, I think. Yes. And, uh, yes. I'm hoping that one still happens. It's driving distance for me. Yeah. Oh, it's happening. The yeah. thing is, it's going to be virtual or real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well. And so uh, it's going to be the, the 15 years class where we will have a maybe a big party in Washington or something or... You know, that's a good idea. We were talking about doing an anthology, but we we, um, we, we definitely should celebrate and Worldcon would be the place to do it. Yeah. Should I cool. tell so, you that... Should yeah. I tell you that we, as the Chilean Science Fiction Society, we are trying to reach Washington DC with an official delegation from the Chilean Wonderful. science fiction. Well, I hope to see you there. Yeah, I will be there. But, yeah. uh, and, well, if, if not for the pandemic, but... You have to uh, go, you already have got your membership, so there's uh, so, no way I mean to... Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you very much again, Neil. We wish you the, the best. And uh, thank you for being in the man in the hand castle. Thank you also to Rodrigo and Luis. So, see you next time. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.